Hello, everybody. This is Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. I am very excited today. We have Charlie Donnelly in the house, and we are celebrating book two of his series, a Rory Moore slash Lane Phillips novel. And this one is The Suicide House. It is an awesome, awesome, awesome thriller. And that you guys are, oh, it's just such a good one. So I am going to go ahead and let Charlie, he is going to give you a little bit more of an in-depth about himself as an author and talk about the new book in the series. Make sure if you have questions that you ask them down below, there's a beautiful ask question button that you can hit to put whatever questions you have. And also we do have books as well as signed and personalized book plates available for you guys. There's a green button that'll take you to the link for that. But I am going to go ahead and virtually walk away and take it away, Charlie. Thank you. Thanks for having me, for sure. Um, yeah, this is always an a interesting concept to do a presentation to a group of readers you can't see. It's much easier to do it in person. But usually when we do this in bookstores, uh, I always get two common questions, which is, um, you know, where do you get your ideas? Is always common. And um, how did you get published? What was your road to publication? So what I want to do uh, as an introduction to myself is talk to you for maybe, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes and kind of give you my background on writing and how I got into writing because it's a little bit of a, uh, of a more unique story for writers. And then um, I'll talk briefly about uh, The Suicide House and Rory Moore, the character that is in uh, the protagonist. And then if there's any questions, we'll go from there and uh, wrap it up after that and go have a drink. Sounds fun to me. Um, so my road to publication was a little bit different than I think a lot of writers. Um, I never liked reading as a child. I never uh, had any aspiration to write. Um, I know a lot of readers have stories of, you know, reading under the covers at night with a flashlight. Um, I was the exact opposite of that. I uh, avoided reading whenever possible. Uh, I always like to tell uh, when I go talk in high schools, I always like to mention that I never read an assigned novel uh, throughout my entire academic career. Um, it was just, I didn't like to read. I just had an aversion to it. I read a lot of Cliff's Notes uh, as a consequence of that. And it wasn't until I was a junior in college that I picked up my first novel to read for pleasure. And that was uh, John Grisham's book, The Firm. And once I picked the book up, I had all of these great feelings that I now learn you can get from a special book when you pick it up, which is I, I started falling in love with the suspense and the characters. And um, once I got into the book, I didn't want to put it down. And when I had to put it down to go to class, I, you know, I couldn't stop thinking about it. I couldn't wait to get back to it. And when I got to the end of the book, I started reading more slowly to, to, so I didn't finish it too quickly. And then when I finished the book, you know, I was sad that it was over. And as soon as I finished that book, I had this epiphany that, you know, I was going to try to write a book someday. I had had... Uh, no experience reading, obviously, that had been my first book. I had no formal training writing. I, if I ever took a creative writing class, I don't remember it. And uh, But something planted its seed in, in, in me that I was going to write a book someday. And um, after I finished school, I uh, had become a big reader at that point. But I sat down and I started writing a novel like I had said I was going to do. And... Um, it took me years to write a manuscript, uh, and I wrote uh, this huge, bulky 600-page manuscript and thought it was, you know, the best thing that's going to hit publishing uh, since John Grisham's book, The Firm. And um, I finished it after a few years, and I sent it out to agents, um, you know, hundreds of agents. I probably, in the course of the year, sent it to 150 agents. And um, was rejected by everyone, uh, not even a kind rejection. They were all just form letter rejection. So I started to realize that maybe this manuscript that I wrote, which was, um, you know, in my mind, this, this great thing maybe wasn't as good as I, I thought it was. Uh, and then that was confirmed when I finally did get a hold of an agent. I had a friend of a friend who 
uh, gave me a referral to his literary agency, and I had the agent read the book, the manuscript, and then he called me. And uh, the first thing he said was, this manuscript's not very good. Uh, it's got bad plotting, the characterization is, is not working, the story doesn't work, there's no suspense. Um, but he said, you're, you're not a bad writer. He said, you know how to write, I, I just don't think you know how to write a thriller. And so um, I said, well, how do I learn to write a thriller? What's the, the path to learning that? And I said, um, just, all you have to do is go read a bunch of thrillers. But he gave me this bit of advice that, uh, that really helped me in the years to come. And what he said was, um, you should go read a bunch of thrillers, but read the book from the author's perspective. And then when you go to write your manuscript, write the book from the reader's perspective. And um, I, I really took that to heart and I started reading a bunch of thrillers. Um, Robert Ludlum, Nelson DeMille, uh, Dennis Lehane, and I would read these books and just highlight them and make notes about why in a particular part of the book uh, I started being drawn to this character. I would say, what is the author doing to draw me to this character? What's the author doing to make me feel suspense at this point? And so I had all these notes and uh, I sat down after I did some of that research and I started my second manuscript. And again, it took me a number of years to write, two or two and a half years to write. And this time when I finished, I sent it off to 15 agents and uh, heard back from nine of them. Uh, nine agents wanted to read the manuscript or some portion of the manuscript. So my uh, success rate was very rocketed uh, after uh, on my second manuscript. So I, I sent it off um, and uh, to these agents and I heard back from uh, my, current agent, my current agent who loved the book. She, she uh, wanted to represent it. Uh, I signed with her. Uh, Marlene Stringer of the Stringer Literary Agency, and I thought I was off and running. Um, I quickly learned uh, over the course of the next year that uh, just having representation by a literary agent doesn't always uh, result in a sale of your manuscript. And over the course of that year that we uh, sent the manuscript off to New York, we were just rejected by um, you know scores of publishers and editors um, we got really close with a few of them, and but ultimately everybody uh, turned the book down. And after about a year of that, uh, my agent emailed and she said, you know, it's time, I can't do any more with this book, it's time to write another manuscript. Uh, so um, I was disappointed, but I sat down. Um, I was still sort of excited that I had someone believing in me, I had an agent, and uh, so I sat down and I wrote another manuscript. And it was over the course of um, a couple of years it took me to write it and um, went through the same process. Once I was finished with it, I sent it to my agent. She liked it. We cleaned it up. And then we sent it off to New York. And I went through the same process over the course of you know 10 or 12 months that I had gone through the previous time, which was we found editors and publishing houses that were interested in the story and were reading it a couple of times, but ultimately the same thing happened, which was uh, all of them rejected the book, uh, rejected the manuscript. And uh, I got the same phone call, you know, a couple of years later uh, after the first one, which was from my agent, and she said, I can't do anything more with this manuscript. We've sort of exhausted all the submissions, and the next uh, stage for you to write another manuscript. So, um, you know, I got off the phone and at that point in my, you know, I wouldn't even, I, it's hard to call it a career because I hadn't at that point earned a dollar from writing. I had representation, but I, you know, I had very little luck getting these books anywhere. So at that point I was pretty discouraged. I was, uh, definitely uninspired and, um, you know, I privately, you know, told my agent I was going to write another manuscript, but I privately, you know, stopped writing and was on the brink of giving up. I just didn't think it was going to happen for me. I didn't think I had the talent to break through. And um, 
after about six months of uh, not writing, I sort of had this feeling where uh, I would wake up with some remorse or guilt, or I, I had trouble sort of identifying what the feeling was. But I finally figured out it was that I had given up chasing my dream. And, and when I stopped chasing my dream, uh, that felt worse to me than all the rejection that I had gotten. So I realized that you know, even if I didn't ultimately get a book published, I at least had to keep keep trying, and that would fulfill some part of me that, um, that kept sort of shouting from the back of my, of my mind. So um, I finally sat down to write uh, what would have been my fourth manuscript. But I had this epiphany, which was, uh, I had two epiphanies. The first one was, you know, if I sat down and I did the same thing again that I had done three times previously, and I changed nothing, um, you know the thing that um, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. So it sort of this was like going through my mind. If I do the same thing and I write a fourth manuscript and I don't change anything about my approach, there is very little chance. Um, and, and this is my like writing brain fighting, you know, sort of trying to be a realist. There's very little chance then I'm going to get a different result. So I asked myself, the second epiphany that I had, I asked myself what I was writing for. Like, what, what was my purpose for writing a book? Uh, what did I want to accomplish? And, you know, the common things that I think all writers uh, are, are interested in or all aspiring writers are interested in, which is, you know, did you want to see your book on a bookshelf? Did you want to see your name on a bestseller list? Do you want to tell your parents that you're a published author? Uh, do you want to have the excitement of signing one of your books over to a reader? Um, all of those things played a role, but, but ultimately what I discovered was the reason that I wanted to write a book, um, I, I sort of came to the understanding by going back to what made me get into reading in the first place and wanting to write in the first place which was John Christian's book, The Firm. And I realized that um, all the things that that book did for me, which was uh, give me those feelings of, you know, I can't put it down, I can't wait to get back to it, um, I don't want it to end, I can't stop thinking about it. Um, all of those things that his book did for me, I realized I want to write a book and I want to do that. I want my book to do that for some random reader somewhere in the world. And so with that sort of epiphany moment, I sat down and I wrote uh, my fourth manuscript about a um, law school student who goes to her family's uh, vacation home in the mountains and is brutally murdered there. And uh, the investigative reporter that goes into this small town and starts to investigate what happened to her. Um, I named that town Summit Lake, and I sent the manuscript off to my agent. Uh, she loved it right away. We sent it off to New York, and within a couple of weeks, we had four publishers interested in the book. Um, and then ultimately, uh, I signed a two-book deal that became my first novel, Summit Lake. Um, I'm now, The Sweet House is now my fifth novel. The books have been translated into 15 languages in 20 countries. Um, I feel like I've come a long way from, from all the rejections originally. I think that's a pretty common story. But I think what I'm most proud of is about a month after Summit Lake came out, I got an email from a reader from North Carolina, which is where the book takes place. And she said, um, you know, I never heard of you or your book, but I picked it up at the bookstore. And uh, I just have to tell you that I couldn't stop reading it. Uh, I didn't want to put it down. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And when it was over, uh, I was sad that it ended. And I realized that uh, in that moment, I think I had accomplished what I was hoping to do. And I realized that if I was ever going to find an audience or keep an audience, I had to try to do that with all of my books. And so whenever I sit down to write a book, I'm always um, – trying to produce uh, in the pages the same feelings 
that I got uh, John Grisham's book when I fell in love with reading and uh, from the first uh, book that made me want to be a writer. So that's sort of my story to publication. That's how, um, uh, how I got here. And so what I want to do next is talk to you about um, my new book, which is The Suicide House. So uh, as we said in the introduction, the, um, the Suicide House is the second book in, in um, the Rory Moore Lane Phillips series. Um, I sort of had an argument with my publisher. You know, I said, I don't want to call it a series because the books themselves are unrelated. It's just that the characters are the same in each book. So you could read them in either order. The first book that had Rory Moore in it was last year's book called uh, Some Choose Darkness. And when Some Choose Darkness came out, Rory Moore uh, became really popular with readers, really popular with my editors, both uh, in the U.S. and in, the, in foreign countries where it's published. And my editors were the ones who told me to bring Rory back. They said, you got to try to write her again in another story because she's a dynamic character. So Rory Moore is um, a cold case. She's, uh, uh, her, her, um, her official title is a forensic reconstructionist. So she looks at cold cases and she tries to reconstruct the crime from uh, all the clues that she finds in the cold cases, in the cold case files. She is sort of my um, OCD, antisocial, uh, on the autism spectrum protagonist that uh, all of her um, so-called disabilities, uh, into, she manages to put those into her career and find a way to, to make them, um, to take advantage of them. And all the, re the redundant calls of her mind that people with OCD have, which can oftentimes derail your life, Rory has found a way to take all of those things, all those daily urges, compartmentalize them, and then use them during her um, work on cold cases. And so um, The Suicide House is a story about uh, an elite prep school in Indiana. Uh, in a town called Peppermill, Indiana. The school, it's a high school it's called Westmont, uh, Westmont Preparatory High School. It's a boarding school. And the story is about uh, two students who are killed at an abandoned boarding house. So there's this sort of hangout that happens on campus, on this uh, sort of on the edge of campus at, a, at an abandoned boarding house. And two kids are killed there. And uh, in the summer of 2019, and quickly a teacher comes under suspicion and is arrested for the crimes. But suspicion and rumors uh, sort of start circulating through campus that the kids who were involved and the kids who were killed were playing an urban legend game called The Man in the Mirror. And um, over the course of the next year, uh, the students who survived that night, one by one, end up going back to the abandoned boarding house and killing themselves. And the, the story picks up so much steam that it becomes the focus of a hit podcast uh, titled The Suicide House. And the podcaster is, um, is uh, Matt Carter, and he promises to do sort of a deep dive into the Westmont prep slaughters, as they're termed and try to get to the bottom of all the rumors about uh, the game that was being played in the woods that night and find out uh, you know, what's true and, and what's false about all the rumors. And in order to make his podcast authentic, he invites Rory Moore, uh, who's a cold case specialist, and her partner, Lane Phillips, who's uh, uh, a former FBI profiler, to consult on the podcast. And um, Rory and Lane are sort of the perfect crime fighting duo. They're um, not only partners in life, but uh, also they work together. Uh, Rory is able to piece together and reconstruct the crime scenes. And uh, Dr. Lane Phillips is able to sort of dive into the mind of the killers. And in this case, he uh, attempts to dive into the mind of the students who are involved in the murder and who survived the night. Uh, and try to find out what they know uh, and what's driving so many of them to go back and kill themselves. And um, Rory and Lane 
once they arrive in pepper mill all hell breaks loose um so that's the suicide house i'm going to quickly just read the inside cover and then uh, i'll check if there's any questions and we'll hopefully answer some questions for you so this is just the um inside flap if you went to the bookstore here and picked it up this is what you'd see inside the walls of indiana's elite restaurant preparatory high school expectations run high and rules are strictly enforced but in the woods beyond the manicured campus and playing field sits an abandoned boarding house that's infamous among westmount students as a late night hangout here only one rule applies don't let your candle go out unless you want the man in the mirror to find you one year ago two students were killed there in a grisly slaughter the case has since become the focus of a hit podcast, The Suicide House. Though a teacher was convicted of the murders, mysteries and questions remain. The most urgent among them is why so many students who survived that horrific night have returned to the boarding house to kill themselves. Rory Moore, an expert in reconstructing cold cases, is working on The Suicide House podcast with Dr. Lane Phillips recreating the night of the killings in order to find answers that have eluded the school, the town, and the police. But the more they learn about the troubled students, the chillingly stoic culprit, and a, and a dangerous game gone tragically wrong, the more convinced they become that something is something sinister is still happening. Inside Westmont Prep, the game hasn't ended. It thrives on secrecy and silence. And as for its players, there there may be no way to win or to survive. So that is Suicide House. Um, I hope uh, it's gotten some great reviews so far and um, has been pretty well received. And I'm really excited for people to read it and get some more feedback on it. Um, so what we're going to do is take some questions. Do my best to read these. So this uh, first one is, which part of the suicide house was the hardest to write, and which one brought you the most joy? Um, good question. I think that I'll start with the last part. The most joy is always the end of the books for me because um, I've heard from a lot of readers that once you get to about the 50 per, fifty percent mark, halfway mark of this book, um, people are reading it in one sitting. And uh, that's always bittersweet for me because, you know, the book takes me a year to write and um, people are flying through it in, in a sitting or two. It makes me kind of wonder, it's a lot of work for just a few hours, but um, I, I loved writing the end of it. I think um, what was hardest about it was, again, this was my second time writing Rory Moore. And she is a super complicated character that was really hard for me to write last year in Some Choose Darkness. Um, and I always say this, I know it's strange to hear, but she's she's antisocial and she doesn't really let people close to her, get close to her. And she's hard to get to know. And I sort of feel like as the author, I had the same um, experience with her. I had trouble getting to know who she was until about halfway through some choose darkness. And then by the time I finished that book, I, I knew that this character was pretty special and I was really, really proud of what I had created. Um, and so revisiting Rory Moore, I just wanted to make sure, number one, that the books could be read in either order. I didn't want people to be turned off uh, if they hadn't read the first book. And number two, I wanted to make sure that I uh, wrote a story with Rory that was, um, that sort of served her and her skills um, as well as some choose dark. So those were uh, a couple that were tough. Um, uh, you may be a little critical in this book of true crime podcasts. Are there any podcasts you've thought were more successful than others? Um, well, this the Suicide House has a like I said, it's it's um, it's about a podcast. Uh, that tries to tell a re that does a retelling of the Westmont Prep slaughters, and one of the uh, podcasts that I listened to that inspired this idea was Up and Vanished, um, which is the story of uh, 
uh, a missing uh, a grade school teacher, um, Tara Grinstead is her name. And uh, she went missing and the case went cold. And um, uh, this podcaster, of course, now I'm forgetting his name, um, I think his, Payne is his name. I can't remember if his first name or his last, sorry. But he did this podcast, Up and Vanish, which was basically he decided to go to this small town and look into this cold case of Tara Grinstead and try to find out in this small town if anybody knew um, anything about the case that the police had missed or or that they didn't tell the police originally. And, um, you know, during the course of, of this podcast, the case was actually solved. And, and you know, people argue that, that this podcaster going into the town and stirring things up actually produced leads that led to the solving of this case. Um, so Up and Vanished is a podcast that I that sort of inspired the Suicide House. Um, I think podca some podcasts that fail, um, you know, you can't, you can't, every podcast or true crime podcast that goes to look into a, a old cold case, I think the promise is always that they're going to come up with answers that have eluded the police. And of course, that's easy to do in fiction. Uh, it's not so easy to do in real life. And so, you know, sometimes I listen to a podcast where they're looking into a cold case with the idea they're going to solve it or shine new light on it. And it ends up just being a retelling of the story. So those sometimes are a disappointment to me, um, but I, I always love the journey, and I, and I think that's a, a a really interesting medium right now, podcasts. Um, mm, good question. So when it comes to your process, how do you hold so many narrative threads together uh, as you draft your book? Um, it was very interestingly written. Thank you. I'm assuming you're talking about the suicide house. Um, you know, every time I'm in the middle of a book, I ask myself the same question. Uh, I know it sounds strange, but I'm writing a book. I'm writing a manuscript now for 2021, and you know, I just sometimes I get lost and I can't figure out how I'm going to pull everything together. Uh, I know I had the same sensation last year when I was writing the suicide house and the year before especially when I was writing Some Choose Darkness. I think Some Choose Darkness um, might be like my most intricately plotted novel. And I know there was a time in the middle of that that I just don't know. I didn't know how I was going to pull things together. Um, I'm definitely not a linear writer. I don't, I don't start at chapter one and, and end at the last chapter. Um, I always know how I want the book to end. Um, I told you that I'm a big John Grisham fan, and one of his rules of writing is uh, don't write uh, the first sentence uh, of chapter one until you know uh, how the last sentence of the last chapter is going to end. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just a good way to keep sort of a, it's like a beacon in the night that you can always write to. So even if you get lost, you have an idea of how you want the book to end. But the problem is how do you get there? You know, you can drive from L.A. to uh, New York. You could take a million different uh, paths to get there. And you know where you're going. You just don't exactly know how you're going to get there. And some of that just comes out in the writing process, uh, in the creative process. Uh, some of it comes out with, from outlining. I mean, when I get stuck on a book and I can't figure out how I'm going to get to the ending or how the two storylines come together, um, I go back to my outline. And if the answer is not in my outline, I, I, I add to my outline. Um, sort of, you know, in the middle of the book, I'll, I'll know more about the characters and the story than I did when I wrote the original outline. And um, that just helps, for me, it helps my brain sort of get a better bird's eye view of the story. And um, every time so far I've been able to do it, uh, I don't know if I'll do it next time or the time after, but um i sure hope i can so let's see um uh for your books are they inspired by real life crimes or are they completely fictional so for sure inspired by real life stuff um 
you know, Summit Lake and the girl who was taken, they definitely had the theme of uh, sort of exploiting um, missing girls and missing women. Um, I don't know if exploiting is the right word, but you always see on People Magazine and some of the other tabloidy-ish magazines, there's always, uh, you always see on the covers a, a girl or a woman who had been missing for a year or 10 years. And now um, we're all interested in her story of survival and her story of abduction and her story of escape. And we all sort of, when I say we all, I'm just saying a, the society as a whole who buys the magazine, we're sort of looking to see, is she recovered? Is she transformed from her, um, from her ordeal? And um, Summit Lake was exactly that. It was a, um, an investigative reporter for Events Magazine, which is essentially People Magazine going to the small town to look into the murder of, of Becca Eckersley in the hope of, you know, sort of splashing her face on the cover of a magazine and telling this grand story. In The Girl Who Was Taken, which was my second book, it's about uh, two high school girls who go missing from um, sort of the end of summer party before everyone is off to college. Um, they both go missing uh, in the small town of Emerson Bay. And uh, two weeks later, one of them miraculously reappears and uh, escaped from the woods. Um, and the other girl is never heard from again. Um, uh, this girl who escaped ends up writing a memoir and it becomes a huge uh, bestseller. Um, sort of with the same theme, everyone's wanting to know about her story of um, abduction and, and what it was like in captivity and how she escaped and is she better and is she healing? And um, the, the book sort of accidentally thrusts her into the spotlight because she's on every morning television show and the book becomes this huge bestseller. And then um, uh, the main character reads the book, who's the She's uh, the sister of the girl who, who never showed up. And she realizes that a lot of this memoir is uh, untrue. And so that starts off this investigation into what really happened. So there is some truth to my, um, to my stories. In Some Choose Darkness, which was the first Rory Moore book, um, it has to do with a serial killer from 1979 who is being paroled after 40 years. And that is a straight rip from the headline story from around the Chicago area, which happened um, last year or the year before. Um, a, a serial killer who kill, who was convicted of killing five people end up being paroled um, after 38 years in prison. And um, well, that story st stuck with me. And I sort of wanted to explore, you know, what would happen if this guy got out? What would the what would the, the victim, his victim's family members be uh, thinking and doing? And that was a lot of the driving force in uh, Some Choose Darkness. Um, and then in the suicide house, you know, I think that we've all heard of, you know, the co-ed killer. And um, uh, this is just sort of a sensational version of, and we've all played or heard of urban legend games. You know, I did, I did a, um, uh, sort of um, online chat with readers, and I asked if anyone had played these urban legend games as a kid. Bloody Mary, Man in the Mirror, um, th they go on and on. But um, so, you, you know, we've all heard of these games, and the idea was to sort of take this urban legend and combine it with, you know, stories we've heard of murders on campus or murders in, in, on college campuses and mold them together and, and see what kind of story comes out of it. And uh, what turned out was the Westmont Prep Slaughters, which, uh, which uh, was pretty fun to write and at moments, I hope, pretty terrifying to read. Um, so there's, this one kind of gets into the woods of the books. I, let me see if I can answer it without giving anything away. So regarding the journals that the students Tap. So in, in the book, students um, are encouraged to write in a journal as a, as a counseling, um, uh, as a method of counseling. 
Um, were their journals meant to be helpful to the students or were they meant to keep control of watchful? Um, so I'm not gonna, uh, I don't know if those are all visible, but um, the journals, uh, specifically the book has a series of journal entries. And if you go onto my website, if you're interested, um, each journal entry in the book is highlighted in on the website. And they're, they're meant to act as clues to help the reader uh, or to entice the reader to try to figure out who the killer is. I think I'll leave it at that because I don't want to, I don't want to give anything away. Um, what do you think the biggest difference between writing a standalone thriller versus writing a series thriller is? Um, well, for sure, you know, when you write, and again, I, I don't want to call this the Suicide House a series so much as a recurrent character, but when you write a series, um, there's a big advantage and a big disadvantage. The big advantage is you hit the ground running as the author. You don't have to create a new character. Um, when you create a new character, um, that character, just as they evolve through the book for the reader, that evolution takes place when you're writing. I mean, you don't know everything about this. For, for an author, I don't know everything about this new character. Um, I learn things as the story progresses and then that character develops over time. And that's, it, it takes a long time to get to know them and to fine tune them. So it, with the Suicide House, I hit the ground running. I already knew Rory Moore. I already knew Lane Phillips. So I didn't have to recreate their background. I didn't have to, you know, figure out their internal conflicts and what motivated them. All that was already built in for me. So the advantage of, of writing a series or a, a book with recurring characters is um, you already have a lot of the of the story down. You already have a lot of the characters down. I think the challenge is that um, you have to remember every single thing about the character. Um, and the longer running the series or the more books that feature that character, um, more, you know, that character has more of a history and their life gets longer, their literary life gets longer. And then you have to remember all of these things about them. So in the third and fourth and fifth book, I, I think it might even be more of a challenge to do a series. When I sat down to write The Suicide House and I knew that I was gonna write another Rory Moore book, I actually listened to Some Choose Darkness on um, uh, the audio version of it, just so that I could um, refresh myself to who Rory was and some of her intricacies. So good question. Um, uh, what are you currently working on? What will your next, when will your next release be? Uh, my next release will be next summer of 2021, excuse me. <clears throat> um, you know, I say that I, I, the book's due next, the manuscript is due next month. Um, so I hope I get there, but, um, what is the book about? The book is, um, I hope I can share the title, but uh, um, I have like a, a mocked up version of it. It doesn't look very good on, um, on the screen, but I can show you a little bit of it. So the, um, it's a black and white sort of cover, but um, so you can't, it does, this doesn't do it justice, but I love the cover. It's called 20 Years Later, and it's about, um, this new DNA technology that is being utilized in New York, in the New York's office of the chief medical examiner. Um, you know, and it's being used to identify 9-11 um, uh, victims who, uh, who died in the Twin Towers, but their remains have not yet been identified. And so one of these uh, um, unidentified victims gets identified with this new technology and it turns out that this that this uh, woman who is identified has a very torrid past and the story is about uh, a character named Avery Mason who's essentially like the Katie Couric or um, Diane Sawyer of ABC News she has a really popular um, news magazine television show uh, called American Events, and Avery goes to uh, New York 
to sort of tell the story about this woman's identif uh, identification um, yeah. using this new DNA technology. And um, then she learns about this uh, woman's torrid past, which was a, a murder investigation that she was part of. And the story takes off from there uh, with our main character sort of hoping to retell this story to um, do an expose on her um, television show called American Events. So that's what I'm working on next. Um, I think we're gonna call it quits. There's one more question here that I'll, that I'll ask, that I'll answer. Um, and then always, you know, will you, bring, will you be bringing characters back in future books? So yes, um, I think Rory Moore is gonna be back in, uh, in a future book. I don't know if it'll be, it's not next year's book. And for my 2022 novel, I already have my folder for book seven sort of uh, mixed up and, and with a bunch of uh, uh, notes in there. And that doesn't include Rory Moore yet. So I think when Rory Moore comes back, it might be for book eight, but um, I'm still in the laboratory there. Um, and then if, if anyone hasn't read my books, uh, uh, just regarding other characters coming back, because I always get the question, oh, will you bring your protagonist back? Because um, if you end up loving a book and you love the character, you want to see them again. And Rory Moore is the first character I ever brought back to be the protagonist, but all my books have some common theme between them. You know, Summit Lake was my first book, and Summit Lake, the town of Summit Lake, appears in a couple of the other books. Um, the, the doctor, Livia Cuddy, who's the, the protagonist of my second novel, she ends up playing a cameo in one of the other books. Um, Gus Morelli, who, who was a detective in a book, he ends up, he's in, he's in the suicide house. He plays a, a sort of a peripheral role in, in helping solve the Westmount Prep slaughters. So a lot of the, there's a lot of Easter eggs in the books where if you, if you read one, um, if you read a second one, you're going to probably pick up on on something you recognize from the first book you read. Um, it's a strange universe that's sort of going on in my mind and um, I've kept it up for five books. So we'll, I'm sure I'll keep doing it for the others. Oh, awesome. That's cool too, that you have like little Easter eggs in all of your books. Oh, Julie just said that she loved the suicide house and that she's going to reread it in a month or two. Oh, thank you, Julie. That's awesome. Oh, gonna read it again. Awesome. <laughs> it's good if you I was about to say especially that we have so much like time at home now having a good thriller that can keep you on the edge of your seats is a very much needed thing in a book collection for sure for sure well that is our time for today on um tonight's event I want to thank you so much Charlie for hanging out with us talking for sure thanks for having me oh yeah of course writing process and everything like that Thank you to all of our viewers on Crowdcast as well as on Facebook and everyone for your questions and everything. But yeah, we are going to go ahead and sign off for tonight. And don't forget, if you are interested in purchasing this book, we've got the buy link down there and you have one week to order an actual personalized book plate, which is pretty challenging to get nowadays. So I think that is mm -hmm. a perk that we have with these orders. But we will go ahead and say good night, everyone, and have a good evening. Thank you all so right. much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.